And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our third annual Idea Incubation Showcase. And we're here to announce the winners of this year's Global Working Groups competition. So an exciting day at Northwestern Buffett. Uh, now, as many of you know, Northwestern Buffett's mission is to bring the brightest minds from across our university and around the world together to address global challenges that can't be sufficiently addressed from any one disciplinary or geographical perspective. And, um, and we really believe that the new genius is a collaborative genius, that the problems of our time are broad and complex, and that no single individual or even field can have a sufficient field of vision to address it all alone. So then the question is, how do you do that? And we have a number of different ways to do it at Northwestern Buffett, but one important way is our idea incubation workshop. And this is a science-based process in which ideas come from the ground up from faculty and we support groups of faculty to try to work across all the boundaries and barriers, discipline, time, and all the rest that usually get in the way of that collaborative genius emerging to try to um, make it possible for people to do something remarkable together. And when groups progress through this process, at the end, there's a competition judged by a remarkable panel of uh, external judges who select our winners. Uh, over the last three years, more than 200 faculty from 68 Northwestern departments and 10 schools have participated in this process. Uh, we have uh, launched 11 global working groups and three of our global catalyst groups, which is our smaller awards. Um, so there's been a lot of activity. Um, and um, um, I want to, of course, introduce the winners. But before we do that, very, very important, uh, I just first want to acknowledge and thank our benefactress who is here today, Roberta Buffett Elliott, without whom none of this work would be possible. So we thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Bertie, it's, uh, it's really truly an honor for all of us to have you in our presence as we discuss these projects. So thank you for joining us with your family. Um, I'd also like to thank um, all the folks who gave of their intellectual leadership, their talent, their time to bring these groups to fruition. It's really is a very, very thoughtful, very intentional, very t intensive process. Uh, first of all, our remarkable Buffett team, Baron Reed, Deputy Director, Dana Dion, Chief of Staff, Aaron Dereshon, our uh, research team, and many others. And this year, we had something new in this process, which was really wonderful, which is that each of our teams had a faculty coach, a colleague, uh, a peer, who had been through the process, was already leading another group, understood a little bit about what this was all about, was able to assist and facilitate those groups. It's a remarkable contribution from some of our faculty to helping their colleagues to succeed. And here I want to thank Diego Rispe Bazan, um, Laura Bruick, Christian Huepe, Candy Lee, who's here, um, uh, Jim Schwatch, and JP Sinadecki for their tremendous leadership. Um, And um, last but not least, um, we had a remarkable panel of judges this year. We had a fantastic day, very intense, worked very hard. And I, um, I, it was a lot of fun, but I also think that uh, many of our groups were really grateful for the fantastic feedback that they got from this panel. So the judges this year, and you'll hear from all of them, either in person or online today, uh, the judges were Ariel Aleksovich, Sustainable Development Officer in the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, Sarah Fodor, who's here, who is a, a, a Senior Executive Director of Northwestern's Office of Foundation Relations. Spencer Glendon, a Northwestern alum, uh, with a career in finance and now the founder of Probable Futures. Maria Haddon, um, Alderwoman for Chicago's 49th Ward. Um, and uh, Professor Kimberly Marianne Susea, Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science here, who was also the co-lead of our first global working group, so has a lot of experience. So thank you to all of them. All right, so without further ado, let's get started. So before we announce our competitor, our winning teams, I thought it might be fun to check in with some of our existing teams to hear a little bit about what they've been up to, how it's going, and just get some sense of what they are doing. So just going to invite uh, VS and Kim, is Kim here? Yes, Kim, hi, there you are. Kim 
And, um, and we also have uh, Mohammed Alam. Mohammed, are you here? Is he joining us? Yes. Oh, here. Hi, great. Come on up. I haven't met you yet. Welcome. Have a seat. So, um, so as I mentioned, Kim is a professor in the political science department. She co-leads our inaugural Disproportionate Impacts of Environmental Challenges Working Group which uh, works in partnership with uh, indigenous communities to measure and address the impact of climate change on those communities. Um, V.S. Subramanian and Mohammed Alam are co-leads of our Artificial Intelligence and Social Movements group, which is working to understand social movements and how they evolve, but also to connect up local groups who, situated around the globe that would have no other way to know about each other and to know about their shared interests but for the remarkable work that they're doing. So pretty exciting. All right, so Kim, let's get started with you. So tell us a little bit about your group. What is it trying to do? And what have been some of your successes so far? It's a green light. Red there light. you go. Red light, green light, OK. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Annalise, and thank you, um, Roberta, for all of your support. Um, I, some of my team members are here in the audience as well, um, Jim Schwach um, and some other, I don't know if there are some other folks. Um, but yes, yeah, so we, um, the Disproportionate Impacts of Environmental Change Group, we set out to really think about how we do interdisciplinary environmental research at Northwestern. And we were really interested in asking the questions of, um, how do um, different groups who are already experiencing the harms of climate change, how are they also impacted by our solutions to climate change? So things like technologies and the, the, um, the green, uh, I'm sorry, not the green, the mining that we need to do to um, source our, uh, provide sources for our electric vehicle batteries. How can we really think about the kind of research that would help mitigate those disproportionate impacts? Um, and so far to date, we've we've actually done a lot. I, I kind of look back, not to brag. Um, I'll brag a little. Um, brag. We are we're really excited to um, announce that we've been successful in securing um, so far three grants. One uh, lo very large grant. We have established the first coastline and peoples hub uh, for the Great Lakes region, funded by NSF, the National Science Foundation, which is providing five million dollars. Um, to help support broadening participation in science by Native uh, peoples. We have secured a $2 million NSF grant to strengthen uh, tribal sovereignty uh, as, a, as a strategy for addressing climate change. And we recently received a Sloan Foundation grant uh, to work on community-engaged life cycle analysis to better improve the mineral supply chain for our green batteries. So very excited. Well. I'm not, a, I'm not a finance person, but it seems like $8 million on a $300,000 investment is a pretty good return for yeah, Northwest. Yes. <laughs> you have to put a value on something <laughs> say this is valuable. But you know, the thing that's been most transformative for us, I think, is the team that we built at Northwestern uh, and the relationships that we've built with communities. It really has been transformative um, for us. And we have built a strong group that um, we feel really comfortable and confident, and our tribal partners have said to us that they've never been approached in such a respectful way as they were by our team. So we feel really proud uh, to be to have this opportunity um, and really grateful for those relationships. That's so. amazing. Thank you. So Vias, tell us a little bit about what you're up to. What are some of your goals, and how's the work going? You're obviously newer at this. You just started this year. How's it going? And tell us a little bit about it. So thank you, Annalise. We're having the time of our lives. Let's start with that. Um, our project is on looking at social movements around the world, and in particular, looking at social movements that are supportive of the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN. So first, we want to look at those. And we want to be able to gather data on the groups that are pushing these social movements forward as fast as possible. And one reason for this is that prior research, not by us, but by others, has shown that once a social movement is adopted by about three and a half percent of the population of the country in question, it basically is unstoppable. So for social movements that are supportive of the SDGs, we'd like to get them to that point by exposing the great ideas that those pushing that movement have 
harnessing and sort of energizing them even more by perhaps connecting them to, uh, or at least connecting their ideas to policymakers in the country in question or the countries in question, perhaps uh, getting them connected with journalists and, but doing, not getting them so much, but as the ideas that they are propounding and the, how the size of the movement is growing. So the way we're doing this is, you know, I'm a computer scientist, by the way, I should say that I'm far from being an expert on social movements. So this really is a partnership that came about in large part because of the idea in incubation process at Buffett. I was brought together with uh, my co-lead on this, Braden King, who's a professor in the Kellogg School, as well as folks in the School of Communication, in, the, in Weinberg, in uh, like Mohammed, uh, who's also in McCormick like me, as well as the Pritzker School, and of course, Buffett. So we have six or seven institutions and several disciplines represented in the work. And we're very, very excited. We produced um, our lawyers, uh, namely the folks from Pritzker, I mean, uh, not corporate <laughs> lawyers, um, have produced a set of guidelines and guardrails that we should use when doing this work, um, in part because we're worried about potential risk to people. However, most of the data we're gathering online is from Reddit and Twitter and from news sources. And so what we're trying to do is to make sure that we don't expose anybody any more than they have already exposed themselves. Um, and so that's, so they've given us a set of guardrails to make sure that we don't do that. So that's been a nice piece of work that my colleagues at Pritzker have done in partnership with us. But I would say mostly they get the credit for 99% of that work. Um, we've been building with Mohammed. I'll, I'm going to let Mohammed talk about this, um, an online platform to do this and to put out the ideas that our team has been pushing. And we're specifically right now monitoring SDGs related to three of the SDGs, SDG one, which is on poverty, SDG five, which is on gender equality, and SDG seven, which is on sustainable energy. And every time I hear Kim, I feel I should be reaching out to her more. So uh, we will get that done shortly. So. That's great. And Mohammed, tell us a little bit about what you've been up to. And also, I'm, you know, I think it, this all sounds so wonderful, but I know how hard the kind of work you're doing is and how many boundaries you have to break and overcome. So tell us a little bit about what some of the challenges are in doing this kind of cross-disciplinary work. Right. So <clears throat> at the very get-go, the biggest problem with any machine learning endeavor, right, in AI is data, right? So how do you collect, collect data? I mean, I, we wish that there was a big repository of data we could just, you know, tap into or buy, but that's just, that, that just doesn't happen because one, there is no such data repository. Number two, even if somebody's holding that data, they're holding it for a real good reason. They want to sell it for a very, very high price. So what we want to do is go ahead and collect that data, uh, which, I mean, there are many methods to do that, but it doesn't come easy because there's just so much data. You have to collect the right kind of data, get the signal and not the noise, right? So that was the first thing we faced, which is if we go to Twitter, if we go to Reddit, how do we identify exactly what data do we, need, we need to collect, right? What constitutes a social movement? Which tweets do we collect and which ones do we not collect? So that was the first thing. And we are fortunate to have two students from the Master of Science in AI um, program, um, which I'm the deputy director of the MSAI program. We have two students from there who are doing a lot of good work coding up a system that collects the data. So now once we collect the data, then the point is where do we store it? How do we view it? Because we need a dashboard to view all the data. Um, and we need to see what, what things are trending, right? So there's that, like how do we figure out what messages, what topics are trending? How do we cluster all this stuff, right? So there are all these technical challenges. On top of that, there are challenges that VS um, alluded to, which is how do we make sure that we still maintain some level of privacy for these people who are contributing the data? This is public data. Anybody can go and look at it. But it's one thing for all the tweets to be spread across the globe versus putting them in one place and saying, these are the people who are saying X or Y, right? Uh, so there are, of course, all sorts of legal and ethical issues. So we are sorting to, that's a big challenge. How do you leverage the data yet do it in a safe way for them, for us, for everybody, right? 
So those are some of the challenges. And um, some of them are, you know, ethical challenges. Some of them are surprisingly technical challenges. Like what technology do you use so that you can, you know, utilize the data yet stay within guidelines, which Pritzker is helping us come up with. So yeah. Really interesting, really interesting. So Kim, I mean, you have, you're, you're the most senior from the Buffett perspective here. You've been through this, uh, your, your group is, I, I guess, officially ending its cycle this year, uh, third year. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how this project has shaped your career and your understanding of yourself as a scholar and what you've kind of, what's changed for you as a result of this? Yeah, thank you. Um, and I realize I didn't tell you what we're doing for research, so I'll try to pepper that in yeah. along the way. Um, yeah, so I'm actually an interdisciplinary environmental social scientist who finds myself in a political science department. Um, and so I've always been interdisciplinary. Um, so I've had to, you know, being a faculty member here, I've had to stretch into the discipline, um, which has been um, great. But, but really, the, the kind of work that we're doing through um, the Buffett in incubation process was, was stretching me beyond what I had ever thought I might do, right? So I have a background in, um, most of my work asks questions about environmental justice. So how do international treaties shape the lives of forest peoples who live inside national parks? How did those peoples respond to injustice by going to international treaty negotiations? And what this project has done is really forced me to ask the question, what's the role of researchers? in constructing justice possibilities for indigenous communities. Um, and so one of the ways that we're answering this question is by bringing together, we have humanities folks, myself as a social scientist, we have lawyers, um, engineers, environmental scientists who all went to the tribes and, and I learned how to do research by listening, um, which was really critical and we really wanted to hear the tribal, the tribe's questions, um, and they had lots of research questions. And one of them, you know, when we talked with them about what's most important for to be resilient to climate change, they said sovereignty. And we thought, well, how do we, how do the engineers, how do we all come together um, and build something? And, and we really, one of the things that they said was, well, data will really help us strengthen our sovereignty. So now we have this advanced sensor network, which if you ever hear me talk about sensors, I am not the one to talk about that, but they're, 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 they're things and they do things. We've, built them. We're, we've, we've built, built them and they're energy harvesting. So they're sustainable sensors um, and they're collecting um, longitudinal environmental data that uh, the, the data is guided by a traditional ecological framework, um, and it's much more complicated, but um, at the end of the day, what it's really done for me as a, as a junior scholar who um, is not yet tenured, it's really actually allowed me to take big risks that I otherwise would, would not have taken. Um, and, and those risks have really paid off and they bring me joy. Um, I didn't used to work in the US as a, I work in Southeast Asia, but um, that's, the, you know, the pandemic created some interesting opportunities. Um, and I'd say that the risks that I could take through Buffett um, really have reshaped my career and launched it in a direction of really focusing on the questions that environmental justice communities have and thinking about how do we design research that serves them? Because when we look at the fight against climate change, the people, who are most impacted are also the people who've been doing the most to conserve our world. And so I think we need to look to them for guidance um, and, and, and teaching us more about stewardship of our environment. And that's, you know, I like, I say, if you know, if, if you're not taking risk during research, what are you doing, right? Um, we really need to be pushing the boundary here, so. That is so inspiring. Um, and I just want to say, you know, it is truly an honor to get to work with you guys. It's, it really is, and it's really exciting. Um, I, I wonder, we only have time for one more question. I'm just wondering, you know, if we have faculty who are here or watching online, kind of dipping their toe in, just kind of peeking into this and thinking, would this be for me? Would you have any advice for your colleagues about how to think about this or any thoughts, any view on that? Well, I think as an academic, we are very privileged. 
And one of those privileges is to think big. Whenever we think of a big problem, we usually cannot solve it with the narrow lens that our own training brings to the table. And so when we think about large societal problems, large global problems, we understand individually some portion of it, and we need partners from different disciplines, from different parts of the world, who can help us get a more holistic picture of, what it, of that problem and understand how to solve it. So I would say, you know, as academics, we're very lucky to be able to do research that we come up with, for which we come up with the ideas for. And if we want to do globally relevant research, which has a global impact, we really shouldn't be thinking just of, oh, how do I write my next scientific paper? You know, I mean, that you need to, you need to do that as well. But how do I come up with a project which will generate for me both the papers I need to write to get tenure in my discipline, while at the same time having an impact which goes beyond just the pure academic community? I would also just say, um really be open to new partners at Northwestern. I, I, you know, I never, I work in forests and biodiversity. What am I doing with computer scientists? Um, but it really, you know, I've, these are my people uh, and, and I'm really, they're people I never would have um, really developed this kind of work with, except for this experience. And so I think leaning into the discomfort that can come from just thinking, how, how will I ever come up with a research question that I can share with this chemical engineer, right? Um, you might have lots of random conversations along the way, but eventually, right, there's a lot of productive work that comes. And now even our graduate students, this has been really actually, you know, we have graduate students who really want to solve problems. And we are modeling for them the type of research that, that they could possibly do, right? They don't have to be constrained. Um, by their disciplines. And I think that's also a really important part of this work. Well, Mohammed, BS, Kim, you guys are amazing. And thank you for sharing today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We'll hear from you again in a minute. OK, so now we, you've heard about what some of our groups are doing. And we're going to move on now to announce our new groups, our winners. So um, it's my pleasure to announce that we have three new global working groups coming out of this year's cycle. And you're going to hear about each one first from one of our judges who will explain why it was selected, and then from one or both of the co-leads who will share a little bit about what they have in mind. So our first group is the Epistemic Reparations Group, which was led by Northwestern Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences Wayne and Elizabeth Jones, Professor of Philosophy, Jennifer Lackey, and Associate Professor of History, Benjamin Frommer. And um, we are going to invite them to the stage in just a minute. But first, is Maria Haddon here? Oh, there she is. Yay, come on up. So just really honored to have with us uh, Alderwoman Haddon from the 49th Ward. And I'll just turn it over to you. Here's the mic. You want to just, uh... so glad you're here. Here, turn it on. There you go. There we go. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. So um, I'm Maria Haddon. I'm older person in Chicago. We're still older people, not city council members in Chicago's 49th Ward. Um, so first, I want to say it was really an honor to be invited to be a judge, um, to get to hear all of your brilliant ideas, honestly. Uh, and this one in particular, um, I think in a uh, one of our largest groups, um, but in a unique uh, interdisciplinary way, really gets to figuring out um, this question that we're going to keep facing as humanity over and over again. What do we do and how do we resolve things? How do we repair? How do we come to reconciliation? How do we move forward? And uh, from a perspective of city government and like kind of a very local level, this may not seem like the, the type of thing that pops up in, in my line of work, um, but it does very frequently. Um, so I'll say really impressed by this group's breadth, um, impressed by how um, 
I guess, how unique the approach is, but most importantly, um, about how much need there is. We need this work to be done, right? Not just in uh, academia, but we need the product of your work out in the world. Like there's so much practical application for this. Um, so really excited um, for you all to be awarded. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for participating. You know, I think it was just so exciting for us to have someone like you who's a leader in our community and um, also a global scholar. You are yourself very established in this field and could connect global and global, global and local for us in really important ways. So look forward to continuing to work with you on this. Yeah, and I think it's wonderful because um, again, I just can't emphasize how much the work that you're doing here in your institutions, the work that Buffett's doing in bringing you together, um, it matters outside of this space so much. All right, thank you so much. Great. Okay, well, Jennifer, come on up. Jennifer, is it, and Ben, just you. All right, here you go. I have slides. Okay, so there's some slides. Is somebody? Just the slides. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> okay, so um, thank you so much uh, to Annalise, to Roberta, to all of Buffett for this opportunity. Um, just in the earliest stages of envisioning this project has already been um, an incredible opportunity. Um, so I'm gonna do, spend just a brief amount of time situating the project and giving you a little bit of context for what we're gonna be doing. I think I was told to not speak for more than 10 minutes and I will honor that. Um, is, is... Yeah, that's good. Clicker. Um, so as was already noted, um, we're going to be focusing on reparations and specifically epistemic reparations, which is why I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes situating this because I don't expect everyone to know what we have in mind. So um, as many of you know, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established in 1995 to investigate human rights violations that took place under apartheid. And a fair bit of our work will actually, we have a lot of partners in South Africa, um, and that's going to be a focus of, of, a, of a fair bit of our work. And um, one of the victims of um, apartheid era violence, uh, Lucas Bawa Sikwapere, um, was uh, testifying to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And he recounted having been shot multiple times by an apartheid era police officer, which led to blindness and severe headaches because multiple bullets were lodged in his neck and face. And when the commissioner at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission asked him, how do you feel, Baba, about coming here to tell your story? Sikwapere responded, I feel what has been making me sick all the time is the fact that I couldn't tell my story. But now I, it feels like I got my sight back by coming here and telling you the story. And this is something that you see repeatedly in context. We're also going to be um, collaborating with, um, we have a lot of partners in Canada and we're gonna be focusing on um, victims of the uh, residential schools. And in this Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, it says the importance of truth telling in its own right should not be underestimated. It restores the human dignity of victims of violence and calls government and citizens to account. Without truth, justice is not served, healing cannot happen, and there can be no genuine reconciliation. And so we're going to be situating our project in, in the context of this 2005 um, report from the United Nations which addressed the impunity of perpetrators of civil and political human rights violations and developed what they called the right to know that victims and their families have to know about the truth, about the circumstances in which violations took place, and in the event of death or disappearance, the victim's fate. And so the global challenge that we're going to be addressing is that his reparations have historically focused on retribution and compensation, but victims of human rights also seek what we might call epistemic reparations. And that's captured in that opening um, quote from Lucas Baba Sikwapere. 
Current processes don't adequately address this critical right to tell one's story and to be heard in a variety of ways. And we're going to make space for these victims to share their knowledge and experience. The project is going to set out to explore and expand the UN Commission on Human Rights framework around the right to know to also include what we call the right to be known and to create spaces for victims to share their stories with others as a form of epistemically reparative work. So we're going to be engaging in a fair bit of um, different kind of global spaces. So we have partners, as I said, the three main spaces of our work are going to be taking place in South Africa, where we're going to be looking at intergenerational victims of apartheid era violence. So we have events planned around, for instance, many different kinds of voices that were left out of the original Truth and Reconciliation Commission. In Canada, we're going to be working with Indigenous communities to be looking at particularly residential school survivors. And we're also going to be situating a fair bit of our work in Chicago and Evanston, looking specifically at victims of carceral and racial violence. Um, we're going to be focusing on the Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions um, US Sustain UN Sustainable Development Goal. And the project is going to offer victims of human rights violations access to a critical and, you know, um, hitherto neglected means to achieve justice individually and collectively through the facilitation of opportunities to testify and document their own stories to a wider public. Um, and ultimately, the goal is to persuade the UN Commission on Human Rights to recognize the critical right to be known. So ultimately, what we hope to do is develop a more holistic and victim-centered framework for understanding reparations that can become a model for analogous projects around the world. So I want to just briefly touch on two different ways in which traditional reparations have been inadequate. So I, oftentimes, there's the complete absence of epistemic reparations. And in the spaces I move in, so I work a lot with victims of carceral violence, this is a very common thing. Um, there will be victims of you know, kind of a wrongful conviction or police torture who will receive a check, but no acknowledgment of any wrongdoing. And so that's the complete absence of epistemic reparations. But then in my two, with my two collaborators in South Africa and Canada, we're going to be looking at the misfiring of epistemic reparations. So many people who participated in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said that they felt pressure or coercion to heal, to forgive, in the name of the nations moving forward. And so there was a sense in which even when there was a space to be able to, tell, uh, to, to engage in truth telling and reconciliation, uh, it misfired. And there have been criticisms of the movements in Canada that they are just an extension of colonial, colonialism because they have been, um, the government has taken the lead on so much of what that will look like. So we're going to be looking at these different ways in which epistemic reparations can either be absent or misfire. Um, we have a group of uh, a team, a broad team uh, across the uh, many here at Northwestern um, and many um, across the globe who will be participating in this. Um, and I want to kind of center, um, I'm the founding director of the Northwestern Prison Education Program. Um, perhaps one of the things that I'm most proudest of in my, you know, kind of my life. Um, these are some of the um, students who will be graduating um, this fall. They will be the first incarcerated people in the United States to graduate with a bachelor's degree from a top 10 university. So I'm extremely proud of these men. <laughs> And they will be playing a, a very significant leadership role in envisioning what reparations for victims of carceral violence will look like. Um, and then here are many of the community partners we're going to be engaging in and you know, some of the um, ultimate kind of goals of the people that we aim to reach and then some of the, the outputs. I just put this up there and, you know, so that you can kind of reach out afterwards and ask some questions, but that's pretty much the, um, the kind of the 10 minute spiel that I was going to give you. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Amazing, amazing. Amazing, amazing work. And I think we had talked with Maria about the relevance of this right here in Chicago also, not just, right? Absolutely. I mean, we're working, I mean, I don't know how much detail you want me to go into, but I mean, I had a meeting already with um, Robin Rue Simmons. We're going to be partnering with First Repair to be hosting Truth and Reconciliation and um, Restorative Justice and Healing Circles in Evanston and working with um, like the Chicago Torture Justice Center to be looking at victims of so we're going to be partnering with a lot of community organizations to be engaging in this sort of work right here at home. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you so much. Great.
Okay, so that is our first project. Oops, got two more. So next up is uh, a project um, entitled Empowering the Next Generation of Global Women Leaders in Universities Around the World. Um, so right close to home. Uh, and Professor Jennifer Tackett is going to speak to this. Before, before that, however, I'm going to ask Judge Sarah Fodor to come up and say a few words. Sarah. So likewise, I'm uh, very honored that you asked me again to participate in the selection and to work with such a great group of judges and to hear the work of um, these wonderful faculty. I always, I've worked at Northwestern 25 years now. I don't have any slides. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, and, and that's a great joy of the job is just learning about our faculty's research and sometimes helping them um, get foundation funding for that research. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the criteria that we use to evaluate the projects, um, you know, with in, in line with uh, why we advised uh, funding this group. So one of the things that we were asked to look at is intellectual merit, and we felt that this group was really strong in providing research about women and um, their educational attainment and how that, you know, they're underrepresented in terms of leadership and that there's a gap there and kind of a hidden curriculum that they um, would hope to, to uh, make available to women to increase the number of leaders in education and in other areas. But interesting to me, during the process itself, they decided to focus in particularly on university leadership. So that was kind of cool to see that happen just, you know, the day of or the day before, I guess. Another area was potential for impact. And so we really thought because this group had experience with the Propel program at the garage, which is the student maker space in Northwestern, and through their programs, they'd been able to increase the involvement of women from 30% to 50%, um, that that was a great start and um, showed that potential for impact through working with other partners. Again, feasibility, that Propel program related to that and the idea of uh, consulting with other partners and other approaches and then um, establishing a range of ways of working with people and disseminating that knowledge. Global scope, um, they have or plan to have partners in multiple uh, countries, including Canada, Japan, the West Indies. I don't want to steal all your thunder, Jennifer. Um, and finally, collaboration, I mean, really interesting to me, you know, Jennifer's from psychology, as you heard, but also faculty from engineering and design and um, from other universities, from Oberlin, from University of Georgia, um, to do, who do this kind of work, a dance instructor at Oberlin, um, talking about how she uses yoga to um, help develop leadership in, uh, in college age students and young, young girls. So we thought that this uh, group kind of knocked it out of the park in all of those areas, and it was great to learn about their plans, and we wish them the best. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, Thank you. Is this the... Yes, yeah, so thank you also so much for the opportunity to be involved in this and the opportunity now to pursue um, this project with support. We're really, we're already getting started. That's how excited we are. So um, we're really looking forward to, to what comes next. So a little bit of the context of the work that we are and will continue doing. Um, it's certainly not subtle um, to note the gender discrepancy in leadership positions. Um, which is very substantial and is most certainly a global and very long-standing issue. At the same time, um, in recent years, we are seeing data coming out from college settings suggesting that women are outperforming men now on literally every education metric in the higher education space. So it's a puzzle to try to think about why this isn't resulting in decreasing disparities for socioeconomic outcomes after college. Uh, we know from data from our team has shown that gender discrepancies in leadership aspirations exist by college entry. Um, women do not motivate to lead. Um, and that we follow across the four years of college experience, college as usual is doing nothing to mitigate this gender discrepancy. Um, so some, something else is going to be needed if we're going to move the needle. Um, increasing female leadership down the pipeline. There's also research showing that access to informal social networks and 
um, leadership development programs in the college years is largely inaccessible to women and individuals who come from under other represented groups. Um, when leadership development programs in college settings do work, they tend to work only for higher socioeconomic white males. So ironically, are actually exacerbating these inequities in the pipeline in later years. So my group is arguing that targeted interventions are needed to promote equity and access to these positions of power and status for women and that we need to be attacking this at an international level. So right now, learning to lead, particularly in the college context, really resides within a hidden curriculum that's inaccessible to women and individuals from other underrepresented groups. Um, the importance of leadership skills are in our face every day. They're very salient in modern society. Um, so it's critical that we're equipping a leadership pipeline from very early um, to face the challenges that um, we're experiencing in the world. G7 nations often rank quite poorly on indices of gender equity. Um, two of the countries that we are planning to collaborate with, Japan and India, rank at 120 and 134 on the Global Gender Equity Index. And even here in the United States, we rank in the low 30s on this index. There's a lot of room for movement here. Um, there are endless statistics that I could pull out to underscore the magnitude of these gender discrepancies in leadership positions, and particularly those leadership positions that have the highest consequence and impact in society. Um, the gender differences are even stronger. 4% of global 500 CEOs are women. Women are underrepresented, grossly underrepresented in the US Congress. Um, and um, grossly underrepresented in presidential chairs of our top universities in the US. Certainly we have statistics like this even here at Northwestern. Um, Sarah mentioned one of the programs that um, we initiated at the garage, our Student Entrepreneurial Center on campus was specifically targeting women. And we saw women co-founder positions move from a third of incoming student co-founders to half in only two years. So we do think that these targeted interventions focusing on women in particular um, can be effective and can be effective potentially quite quickly if they're implemented. So that's our goal. Um, our two UN Sustainable Development Goals are pretty clear. We're tackling quality education and gender equality. We have a number of secondary goals that will be directly impacting as well. But one of the things we talked about a lot in our team and in the, in the incubator workshop space was that um, if this project is, when this project is successful, um, it really stands to move the needle on every single sustainable development goal because we're populating a more skilled, more versatile, and more diverse leadership workforce. So what we want to do is create a global network of interventions for empowering the next generation of women leaders. And we're focusing on the university context as a critical developmental point um, to really make highest impact for much longer term gains. Unlike existing leadership training models that tend to be unidimensional, one size fits all, we're proposing something quite different. We're a highly interdisciplinary team, as Sarah mentioned. Um, and we think that that's particularly important when we're dealing with issues of equity and access. So we're creating a multidisciplinary integrative program that's highly values-based, meets people where they're at as individuals and their own lived experiences. And of course, will be uh, launched from an international capacity. And this work will position Northwestern as the thought leader in women's leadership development. We also see this initial project as the first step in what we hope will be a much longer term um, research endeavor, um, starting with women. We do hope that this work will create a template and a very translatable framework that we can then bring to members of other underrepresented um, and marginalized groups for leadership development work. Um, our team is very diverse. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun working with these people. And certainly, um, you know, the comments that were made earlier about needing to find a common language, it's both a challenge um, and such an enriching experience to engage in this. We have psychology, engineering, computer science, design, 
higher education experts, entrepreneurship experts, and then Anne is our dance professor who has her own leadership development. And the thing that unites us all is we've all developed self-directed interventions for college students that are really aiming to create a new form of individualized leadership skill and doing that from an equity and accessibility lens. We have a long and currently growing list of partners. We'll of course be working with partner institutions at um, institutions of higher education in other countries and other parts of the world. We are also actively partnering um, with a number of nonprofits um, that are found around the world. We have Northwestern and other domestic partners that are also engaged in leadership development in the college years um, and particularly gender equity access perspective. And we're building a network as well of successful women leaders um, who are gonna be our sort of board of experts. And that will allow us to work on this from both kind of a prospective angle as well as a retrospective and learn more about successful women leaders defining um, change points in their own college experiences. So year one of the project will largely be focusing on mapping the current landscape. So we're gonna do a really deep dive, large scale information gathering, what's being done. Um, so this will involve a lot of virtual visits and emails and Zoom calls, I'm sure, um, with individuals at other universities around the world to find out what they're already doing and why and how it's working. We're gonna hold a workshop here at the Buffett space with Northwestern domestic and international partners currently engaged in this work to come together and share success stories, but also um, to really be kind of a think tank around what do you think works and why? So we're really trying to get sort of a scientific level drilling down to what's gonna be most effective and impactful in these interventions. We're gonna conduct a number of site visits to our international partners that are engaged in this work. Uh, my co-lead, Hao Chi, could not be here tonight, but um, he and I really want to immerse ourselves in the spaces themselves and in the global context in which the leadership development work is occurring so that we can try to unite what's happening both at the individual level and in the spaces um, that they're developing in. And at the end of year one, we plan to have uh, built a taxonomy of these current approaches um, from a global level, what's already being done, but also again, scientifically synthesizing the information so that we can identify the highest impact potential targets for change and identify the potential mechanisms underlying that change. Year two will be focused on implementation and measurement. Um, so we will engage in harmonized implementation and assessment of women's leadership interventions. Um, we'll also be using a, an iterative participatory research design. We already heard a little bit about this um, premise and uh, really engaging female students at our international uh, at our international collaborating institutions to join us as thought partners and co-creators of a leadership development intervention that can be launched internationally. Um, we'll collect pilot data at our international sites as well as here at Northwestern, involved, of course, in synthesizing and disseminating these data. And toward the end of year two, we want to host an implementi implementation science workshop here, leveraging some of the great implementa implementation science um, expertise we have down at Feinberg. Um, we're going to try to bring them in and help us think about how we can then move toward a large scale dissemination of the work. So I'll end with this quote, that gender equality is more than a goal in itself. It's a precondition for meeting the challenge of reducing poverty, promoting sustainable development, and building good governance. And again, we're very grateful for the opportunity. So thank you. Thank you so much. Amazing. Great. And OK, last but not least, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our third new global working group. Uh, which is called Making the Water Crisis Visible, and it's co-led by Professor Sarah Young, Associate Professor of Anthropology and Global Health in the College of Arts and Sciences, and Julius Lux, Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering and Associate Chair of Chemical and Biological Engineering. Come on up. Sarah, where are you? There you are. Come on up. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Sarah. Excuse me. First, we're going to hear from Kim, right? Isn't that right? Sorry, Kim. Come on up. So Kim, you're hearing from Kim again because she was also a judge in addition to being um, one of our leads. So please. They just, yeah. you know, I, I feel bad that you have to hear from me again. Um, but I'm really excited uh, to introduce this group. So as you all know, I care about environmental problems. And, and there's a term that we use in political science um, that call most of our current problems super wicked problems. Um, and this is a phrase 
students like until they learn what it means. And it means that these are problems that time is running out. We have to solve them quickly, that there's no real authority to make a decision about how to solve the problem. And that um, we irrationally discount solving the problem into the future, right? We say, oh, well, if we, it's a future thing and we'll take care of it then, right? And so these are the kinds of problems um, that the group making the water crisis visible is really trying to tackle. And we often talk about environmental problems um, as needing, right, a, a huge diverse range of folks um, thinking about the need to really have cooperation and, cre and creativity, but also really break with the ways in which knowledge is created and deployed. And this group making water, the water crisis visible exemplifies the type of creative and collaborative and problem driven research that can help move the needle on super wicked problems around water availability, accessibility, and acceptability. And when we were reading their proposal, there were a few things that were particularly inspiring uh, in terms of the kinds of questions their work demands that we ask as researchers. And the first is, how can we solve problems that we don't see, right? And so this, um, they'll probably tell you a lot more, but they're really trying to tackle a problem that exists around the world, but we just don't see it. Um, and they're creating tools to make it possible to see these problems. The second one was how can we solve problems that we only see through our own cultural lens? And so they're using, uh, um, they're tackling a problem that's understood and experienced in a myriad of ways uh, that's really shaped through cultural traditions and practices. And they're using a cross-culturally validated tool to do that. And the third question they pose to us is how can we solve problems that we approach through trad traditional disciplinary silos? And so what they're trying to do in this project, and I really was inspired by this, is thinking about the multiple environmental, social, technological, political, blah, 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 dimensions of all of these problems. Um, and by the way, they are self-proclaimed superheroes, uh, and, and <laughs> they're bringing us, I don't know if you remember, she doesn't remember, they're self-proclaimed superheroes, and they're bringing together policymakers, practitioners, and communities from two, uh, from three countries on two continents to break some boundaries with their research. So thank you for the opportunity uh, to be a judge in this process and to also introduce uh, my great colleague and friend, Sarah Young and Julia Slutt. What a nice introduction, thank you. And <laughs> I am reminded we had an Avengers slide on our, <laughs> on our presentation to the team. But in fact, we have since met in Avengers last week, thanks to the Buffett um, <laughs> Institute. We were at a foreign policy summit where we met an actress, Kobe Smulders from the Avengers, who told my daughter that she thought I was a superhero for studying research, uh, studying water, to which my daughter was like, please. <laughs> 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 right. So we are making water insecurity visible. This is our team. Um, we'll be presenting my partner in crime and life, and I will be tag teaming for this, but I'll, I'll kick things off by telling you that we're here to do nothing less than make the world think differently about water. Uh, I think the problem is pretty clear. Almost any day when you open the newspaper, you can see that there are problems with water. And those problems are multidimensional. Sometimes it's an issue of water availability. Other times it's access, either economic access or infrastructure. There are myriad ways that water can be unsafe. And of course, it's not always reliable. And much of those issues, however, those four domains, they go unseen. And the reason for that is because the way we measure water, it's fallen short. And many people on our team have seen this in different ways. This is just one little story. Um, so in Kenya in 2013, I was doing field work. And this woman here is going to fetch water. And if you would measure her water security by traditional measurements, well, there's water physically available. Lake Victoria is right there. And there's infrastructure on her compound, but her mother-in-law is not letting her use that water. So she went to fetch water and went into early labor and had Lots of sad stories from that. So when you think about those four domains, we can see that the water is indeed available, but her access and her safety and the reliability of that water is invisible. So this it's no secret that our data on water 
are not great. I was talking with Senator Duckworth, one of her, her water staffer, and she said, you know, our water quality, our, our data on water in the US is like a D minus, and it's not much better anywhere else. So this is, it's not a secret. The, in 2018, the high level panel on water said that you can't manage what you can't measure, and it's particularly true for water. Like major gaps exist. So our goal is to reveal the invisibility of problems both with water access and use, and that's what I'll be talking at you about. And then I'll pass it to Julius, who'll be talking to you about how we're gonna make water quality visible. Um, we are not the only two who are doing this. We have an amazing team of people across disciplines. You can see color-coded. We have social scientists and engineers and policy experts. And we have a, a strong core here at Northwestern, but we also have leaders in both Mexico and Kenya who are um, really bringing a diversity of perspective to this project. So to tackle water access and use, we're going to be using the water and security experiences scales that Kim so lovingly characterized. I appreciate that. And what these do are these are 12 items that measure people's experiences with access and use. We started developing these um, a million years ago in 2018 with a team of researchers from across the world, across disciplines, and we collected these data and, and tested these items in 28 sites globally. So we really stress tested these questions. And after much blood, sweat, tears, and statistics, we landed on 12 items that really captured universal experiences with water access and use. So just for example, often have you had to change the food you ate because of problems with water? How often has your water supply been interrupted? And you know, fast forward a few years, the wind is in our sails. Um, the WISE scales have been implemented now in more than 48 countries and by lots of organizations. <clears throat> and there's a reason I think that people are, are paying attention to this. I think there's a noted recognition that knowing that there is water in the lake out there or that there's a tap in my house, you know, necessary but not sufficient for water security. But also these data can be, the information can come from different levels so we can understand what's happening at a, at a national level and we're doing that for example with gallup and unesco but we can also calculate the return on investment of if you build a borehole what is happening with people's water security and their health and we can tag this to other outcomes so you may care about water for water's sake but you may care about water for food sake or for health sake or for mental health sake or for infant feeding sake and it's for those reasons that there's discussion of the Y scales becoming a sustainable development goal indicator in the post 2030 agenda, which thrills us to no end. And just as sort of like a, 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 a moment on this journey was last week, we were in Mexico City with a meeting of 60 leaders from throughout Latin America. I mean, there were, I think, 12 or 13 countries represented. The U.S. Embassy, Health Attaché was there, government leaders, UNICEF, FAO, World Food Program. And we're saying like, this is the way forward. This is how we need to be measuring water and security. Um, this is how we need to be measuring water and security. Sort of the next step for this is to make sure that we have nationally representative data in all 160 countries. We're, we're, we've got 45 of them, I think. We're well on our way there. So with that, I'll turn it over to Julius. Got my own here. Thank you. Um, so uh, as Kim mentioned at the beginning, this is a really a multifaceted problem, the, the challenge with water. Um, and the other dimension that we're trying to tackle is one of quality. This picture of a drop on the screen is really nice because it reflects the fact that in most cases, we often cannot see or taste or detect ourselves things that are that are bad for us in our water supply. That really hampers efforts across the scale, whether it's large scale data needed to attack the global challenge, all the way to an individual's daily choices where they find uh, and, and manage what water they consume for their daily lives. So we wanna, we wanna tackle this challenge. Humanity can do this. We have wonderful instrumentation, things like these machines that can detect whether or not there's pathogens in your water or, or chemical contaminants. The challenge is, as you might imagine, these machines are expensive. They require power, they require skills to, to, to operate, and they're really not suitable to the scale of data that we need to, to, to unlock uh, the real challenges with water. 
Um, we, you know, we take the view that a central tenet of this project is that we believe it should be a right to know what's in your in your water, as we've espoused in the pages of things like Scientific American. It's essentially, what we want to be able to do is create technologies like the ones shown on the right, whether it's a pregnancy test or an at-home COVID test, something that everybody can have can use and therefore have access to this information. Um, I'm fortunate to co-direct the Center for Synthetic Biology here at Northwestern. And what's fascinating of that field is to go and ask, well, what can nature do to help solve these problems? And it turns out that microbes can, can see and taste the things that we can't. And so as synthetic biologists, uh, uh, many of us have gotten together and figured out how can we extract the molecular machines from those microbes and make little tests that work like an at-home COVID test, but in a safe and easy to use format. And this is just some images showing you there. Now, this technology is being developed over a number of years, but that doesn't mean that it's accessible to the people we want to help most. And so a big part of this project is collaborating with social scientists uh, and, and others to try to figure out how can people really uh, use this technology and how does it affect their daily lives. Um, you know, we've started to do this uh, project that Sarah and I just published on the first field trial of this technology in Kenya with some very promising results. But as Kim mentioned, there's a lot of social factors here. And so we want to understand do, are the lessons learned in one setting applicable to all the places that they need to operate um, across the world. So we're partnering with a lot of people in this particular project. We're going to focus on lead contamination since it's in our backyard, uh, partnering with people across the city of Chicago and Evanston uh, to develop these technologies and validate them and perform the social science studies needed to then translate them more globally. I'll pass it back to you. So I will not go point by point through what our global working group is going to do, but you can ask me about that during drinks. I'll just say briefly that we'll be doing ethnography, we'll be doing surveys, we'll be testing those biosensor tests that you saw in low resource neighborhoods across three different types of settings. So we'll be working here in Chicagoland and I'm very happy to say that there's a lot of interest in this work from Senator Durbin, as well as from those of us who care about the lead and copper rule, since they'll be revisiting that in the next year. We'll also be working on this with the government of Nuevo Leon in Mexico. They were also at the meeting in Mexico City. They're very excited to be seeing this work implemented. And we'll also be working in um, Kenya in a couple of settings. And these very specific case studies, if you will, will be framed by the global data and um, policy outreach that is possible through our connections with Gallup, World Poll, and various UN entities. And like the other groups, we're eager. <laughs> we're starting now. We already have been, um, we spent a, a great time in New York at the UN water meeting. As I mentioned, I'm hanging out with the Avengers in Washington, DC. But it was a great panel because um, the president of Save the Children was there and, and the, the person who oversees water for the Department of Interior. They're, they're seeing the value and, and it's really coming together. And I have to really just appreciate um, Roberta Buffett at the Buffett Institute and my team for being this momentum that, you know, now is the time for, for this work. And I really appreciate the support that we're being offered to make this happen. So thanks very much. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you so much. So I think you can all see what, uh, how much talent we have at the Buffett Institute, what remarkable people are doing, coming together to do really, really, really important work. And Bertie, I just want to thank you for making it possible for all these folks to really do their very best work and uh, just to hope that we'll make you proud. That's the way. <laughs>